Hello and welcome to our couch lesson number 11. After a long summer break, we are back and until the end of October, we will talk again about a lot of exciting topics related to artificial intelligence, as always with AI experts from all over the world. And as always, we start with a music piece made or made by or with an AI. This time it was the song Mr. Shadow, one of the first ever entire song composed by AI. Scientists of the Sony CSL Research Laboratory have developed a system called Flow Machines and uh, this system learns music styles from a huge database of songs. Mr. Shadow is composed in the style of American songwriters such as Irving Berlin, Duke Ellington, George Gershwin and Cole Porter. And the French composer Benoit Carré arranged and produced the songs and wrote the lyrics. So if AI can compose music, Will it take over deeply human capacity like creativity? This has been one question we dealt with during our first 10 couch lessons. And we will go deeper into this aspect of artificial intelligence with our session about music and AI. Just one topic of our following seven couch lessons. The couch lessons are funded by the Federal Foreign Office and organized by the Goethe Institute, the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. My name is Jeanette and I work for the Goethe Institute in Munich and with the couch lessons we want to initiate a discussion outside the technology savvy community and we want to question what AI is and what it could and should decide. We also want to ask if there is a way, maybe a European way, beyond surveillance and commerce, because a lot of developments in the field of AI are economy driven so far. It's all about power and money, or isn't it? The Goethe Institute deals with AI because this technology will have a huge impact on our society at different levels and in various fields. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history and it is already a part of our everyday lives. It shows us the shortest route to our destination and it calculates which films, books or songs we might like. But that's not all. Algorithmic decision systems are also used by governments to determine determine the risk of prisoners relapsing or the probability of unemployed people to find a new job. In addition to the advantages of artificial intelligence, there's a real risk that the use of these new technology by governments or companies will have a negative impact on human rights. Military robots, for example, will in the future incorporate AI that could make them capable of undertaking tasks and missions on their own. And this is one of the topics we want to speak about in our couch lesson of today. But before we start, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of the couch lessons. First, our experts will give an input each about uh, 15 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion. And during the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat. And I will go through the chat and pick out some of the questions that will be discussed later. I I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally, but if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. With this, I will hand over to my co-host Martin, who will moderate the lesson and who helped me curating the whole series. And thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, Malmö, Sweden. Uh, and wow, how excited I am to start another season of the Couch Lessons. Uh, when we started season one in May, uh, we did so with a session on COVID-19 and being human felt extraordinarily turbulent. Four months later, things are still turbulent, but protocols for human exchange have been put into place, making the world easier at least to navigate. However, it's still by no means normal. Uh, and although we're, we're all alone by our computers, uh, there is no reason to feel lonely in this moment. Uh, and let us all acknowledge the fact and take a moment really to celebrate it, that people from all over the world are in this call. Uh, it's easy to take for granted, but it's quite a beautiful that you, 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 
uh, found out about this, decided to sign up and showed up. So wow and congratulations to us. Let's have a, uh, a fantastic coming hour together. Um, to get the conversation going in the chat, uh, please take a moment to type uh, where in the world you're tuning in from. Uh, and if you want, please also state if you've attended a couch lesson before and maybe what session uh, and so on. That would be super lovely. Uh, and with us today, we have uh, author, professor and strategist Peter W. Singer, as well as a senior fellow at uh, Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, -Pro Angela Kane. The topic is AI and peace, of course, a huge one, another big topic for us. Uh, and I'm of the generation that grew up with the state of the world becoming gradually better when it comes to global security, with the Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall coming down, political scientist Francis Fukuyama in 1992 proclaiming the end of history and arguing that the end point of mankind's ideology ideological evolution and universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Uh, I should have learned earlier, but the past 10 years has been sort of a shock for me, realizing that new conflicts can and do blossom. I mean, it just feels so uncivilized and unnatural. Um, and it is, but of course, uh, it's still happening. And 18 years ago, I served as a UN peacekeeper in Kosovo. Uh, and already back then, I remember purchasing a book called Virtual War. And in the time that has passed, we've seen a massive technological development affecting, and in many cases, led by military investments. And in preparing for this lesson, I, I even asked myself, what is peace really? Somehow, on a conceptual basis, I think of it as the normal state of the world. But after reflecting on it, it is, of course, I, I sort of realize how naive it is to think that. Um, you don't have to be a historian or a political scientist to know that if there's one thing that repeats throughout history, it's power struggles, uh, and with a certain consistency, even war. But the complexity of this topic is far greater than the binaries of war and peace. And tonight, we're going to dig into the effects that AI has on security and stability in the world. The title of today's session is AI and Peace, but it's going to be clear that it's the instability of the world that we need to sort of learn to address and understand before even dreaming of peace. So let's get started with the first speaker who will help us set the scene and bring our attention to some of the challenges that we're facing. His name is Peter W. Singer. He is a strategist at New America and a professor of practice at Arizona State University. He's the author of several books, included Wired for War, Cybersecurity and Cyber War, and Like War. Please beam your energy to Peter Singer. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction and also to all the organizers for bringing us together from around the world on this important topic. Now, I know at a certain point you're gonna get tired of looking at my face, so we're gonna try and uh, see if the technology will allow us to do a share screen here and uh, draw in um, some imagery to keep you engaged. All right, uh, great. Um, the starting point for myself on this topic is actually a book that um, was called Wired for War. And it came out uh, back in 2009 and explored what were this science fiction technology of robotics doing to the real world of war. Uh, for example, we are just a couple days past the 9-11 anniversary. And when US military and then NATO forces went into Afghanistan back in 2001, they had zero unmanned systems in them, robotic systems. Today, the US military by one count has over 22,000 unmanned systems in them. Many of them, of course, aren't. But it's not just the US military, nations around the world. In fact, over 80 different militaries uh, from Germany to Sweden to Israel to Russia to China, you name it, have all begun to use this technology. And it's resulting in questions that range from what does this new technology of robotics mean for everything from who fights in wars 
to where you fight in wars. If we think of, for example, the so-called drone wars, the undeclared operations that have taken place uh, everywhere from Pakistan to Somalia. But my sense is that in the period that's played out uh, since 2001, is that actually this story of a change of technology and war is actually only a small part of a much larger story that's not just an important story in technology, but arguably one of the most important stories in all of human history. Think about it this way, not just in 2001 in the military, but overall, the concept of hardware and software crashing together in new ways. So artificial intelligence and increasingly autonomous robotics have taken the science fiction of Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 and made it a real technology that's disrupting fields that range from medicine to finance, not just war itself. And there is no other area of technology that is moving at as fast a pace, has as many groups working on it. Uh, so for example, by um, one study, there is 153 billion US dollars worth of spending that has an annual creative disruption effect of $33 trillion. The participants in the AI revolution range from the leading governments of the world. For example, it's at the center of the US national defense strategy to China has a plan to be uh, the world leader in AI by the year 2030. It also involves all the world's leading research universities to all the world's leading technology companies from the Googles, the Facebook, the Baidus. They are each spending billions of dollars on this, but it's also not just tech companies. McDonald's and John Deere recently bought up an AI startup because they see the future of fast food, the future of farming and tractors to also be driven by AI. It's also the dreams of the next great companies, the next Microsofts, the next Baidus. As the founder of Wired Magazine put it, quote, I think the formula for the next 10,000 startups is to take something that already exists and add AI to it, end quote. Now, this um, effect from this, what's been called everything from a new industrial revolution to a second machine age, um, it's very exciting. But I think it also results in three big questions that we have to work out. The first question is, what will be the impact of all of this automation, not just on individual jobs, but the economy and then everything that flows out from the economy, politics, society, you name it. Now, many people think that new technologies lead to new jobs and opportunities, but the data also shows that they lead to displacement and replacement on a massive scale. That is what happens when you rewire the economy and the society beyond it. So, uh, for example, an Oxford University study of 702 different job professions out there found that roughly 47% of them are at risk for replacement or reduction by robotics and AI within the next two decades. Now, think of the effect of this, not just in um, society, but it, of course, ripples back to hit the discussion point of war, not just in terms of the people that pull the triggers, but this will hit across the board in the military, everything from medicine to logistics, you name it. But there's a larger issue at play. If this is a parallel to the Industrial Revolution, think about how the last Industrial Revolution with its new economic and then political winners and losers at the individual level, the organizational level, the national level, the global level, spawned everything from mass consumer goods to mass production of weapons, to new great powers, to climate change, to mass movements of people, to new mass political movements that range from ones that we would see as positive no industrial revolution. There would be no children's rights, no women's rights, no workers' rights. Oh, by the way, the industrial revolution also spawned fascism, communism, that we'd spend roughly a century working our way through. Now, that's challenging enough, but there's a second question that comes out of it. Every new technology leads to new questions of right and wrong, law, ethics. We saw that with the flying machine. We saw that with an undersea boat. The same thing will happen with AI and robotics, but this is a different kind of tool. It's a tool that is increasingly intelligent, autonomous because of artificial intelligence. 
And that means we get new legal ethical questions that we never dealt with before. One is machine permissibility. What should our ever more intelligent and capable machines be allowed to do on their own? And the second is machine accountability. Who should own them? Who gains the fruits of what they gather and do out there on their own? Who owns them in terms of accountability when things don't go the way that we planned? And what's so fascinating about this and so important is that these questions are already starting to play out everywhere from our highways to our battlefields because the technology is being applied across those spaces. Think about, for example, um, AI's application to face recognition technology. It's being deployed into the military. The US military is a program to use face recognition to identify targets at 1,000 meters in the dark but it's also being applied by police forces uh, everywhere from Moscow, Beijing uh, to uh, New York City. But it's also being applied by companies from tech platform companies, the Apples, the Facebooks, to companies that you might not expect. For example, Kentucky Fried Chicken had a face recognition program. Now, these programs will deliver arguably more security, but they also deliver new questions of privacy. It takes Orwell's concept of big brother and adds a new riff on it, not just in terms of the technology, but if it's Kentucky Fried Chicken, we've got now a big kernel. But finally, we've got the third issue, new kinds of security questions. When you have all of this tracking on a scale like never before, it doesn't just lead to new issues of privacy about your history, but it also leads to new issues in terms of prediction, and influence of behavior itself. That is face recognition technology. It matches a face to an identity, but it then takes that identity and links it back to everything that we know about that person in the data set, from um, everything they posted online, everything that they bought, everything that their friends and family said. Then you can use that information, not just to map their history, but to predict what they might do next, where they might go next, how they might vote next, or if it's a battlefield commander, where they might deploy their forces next, but you can also influence their action. Again, shaping what they buy, what they vote for, how they deploy military units on a battlefield. And the result of that is a massive rethink of not just commerce and politics, but war itself. In many ways, we are living through the equivalent of, say, 1914 when the very first flying machine crossed enemy lines and sent back information that couldn't have been seen before, but also began to fight there. Or if we think about 1940, when they lashed up airplanes and tanks and wireless communication, that kind of game change is playing out. But it's also new types of attacks that we've never seen before. So we already have deep challenges in cybersecurity mostly from the theft of information from your email, for example. Now, with this emergent Internet of Things, but intelligent Internet of Things, we're seeing new vulnerabilities open up, but also they can be exploited in new ways. So a cyber attack might cause physical effect. It might be at an individual level, for example, um, killing someone in a smart home without ever leaving your own home or it might be on a larger city or national level. For example, we've recently seen in um, Israel targeting of water systems, not to steal information from them, but to affect the chemical output of it. And uh, for a book project, we studied cybersecurity at water treatment systems, for example, around the United States. And, um, and it's the same for most everywhere in the world. If you think that your water systems have better cybersecurity than the Israelis who are considered among the best in the world. I have very, very bad news for you. This technology though was already in play. The coronavirus pandemic is only gonna make all of this speed up. In many areas, we are seeing a jump ahead in use. Uh, so for example, the field of telemedicine, in a matter of weeks, it jumped forward to where people in that industry thought they would be 10 years from now. Or you think about what we're doing here, distance work, distance education, well past when anyone imagined. 
You're also seeing the physical rollout of robotic systems happening on scale. So for example, there had been um, small scale use of uh, in isolated locales of robotics to do um, policing or delivery. We're now seeing, for example, um, uh, robotic systems delivering groceries, delivering coronavirus test kits, you name it. The point of, and then if we get to thinking about AI surveillance that I talked about before, when you move to not just um, tracking our data, but tracking our physical movements, our contacts, even our temperature, we get to a level of AI surveillance of the individual and society beyond not just what science fiction imagined, but what the Chinese government had even planned for. And the reality of this is when we make our way through the pandemic, we're not going back to the way that we were before. Now, if these are our three challenges, we have three problems in how we deal with them. The first is a disconnect between our understanding of this. So uh, you can talk about this in both numeric and story ways. In the numeric way, 91% of leaders say AI is the most important technology out there. 17% of leaders say, I understand it. Now, as you well know, leaders tend to overestimate. So that 17% is probably high, but that is still a massive disconnect. 91% saying it's important, 17% saying I get it. It also is often thought of something off in the distance. Uh, for example, the US Secretary of the Treasury said, well, this stuff may matter, but not for 50 to 100 years away. That's just point blank wrong. It's playing out right now as we've talked about. The second issue is illustrated by this. It's a robot designed to examine stove pipes. And by this, it's a sort of silly way of going after how people who are interested in, like us here to get together, war, peace, the discussions on the future of war are different than the discussions on the future of work, are different than the discussions on cybersecurity, are different than the discussions on ethics. And yet, this is a space that's all about networking and bringing them all together. And then finally, there's this, an irony. Just as the technologies from science fiction are coming true, our science fiction has not been all that helpful. We are on the 100 year anniversary of the creation of the word robot. It was for a play in 1920, and it took the Czech word for servitude and used it to describe the playwright's idea of mechanical servants who wised up and then rised up against their masters. And ever since that story of killer robots has cut through our science fiction. It's also affected our discussion in the real world, everywhere from US military policy to the floor of the UN has debated this. And yet, maybe one day we have to figure out whether to salute or fight our metal masters. But in your and my lifetime, it's these issues of a robotics revolution, not the killer robots coming to kill you. And so that's what we tried to wrestle with in um, this book, Burn In, but we tried to do it in a very different kind of way where we smashed together nonfiction research on robotics and AI, how it would be used, but packaged it within a novel to help people visualize it. Uh, in many ways, you can think of it as I'm a parent is trying to sneak fruit and veggies into a smoothie. And the idea behind this is that narrative can be a more effective way of sharing concepts because guess what? Narrative is the oldest communication technology of all. We were using stories to share information when we were gathered around fires in caves. By contrast, PowerPoint, it's 30 years old. So in closing, and I'm sorry, what's been exciting about this in closing is that we've been able to share these insights, um, not just with groups like you, but with governmental agencies and militaries around the world by taking the concepts, the research, but packaging it in a new kind of way. And that's what I'd like to close on is that with so much change swirling around us, especially in this technology, shouldn't we try and change the way that we share our important work? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's a, that's a good, very good uh, rhetorical question uh, to, to end with. And, and I suppose the answer is yes. Um, and uh, we're happy that, that you shared your thoughts and, and, and uh, uh, with us in this, in this semi-new way, at least. Uh, we will invite you back at the end for a Q&A. Uh, but please, uh, everybody, 
ask questions in the chat and we'll make sure to uh, incorporate them in the discussions after the talk. Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about regulation of warfare. Her name is Angela Kane. She's a senior fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Uh, she holds a number of other functions as well, such as being the vice president of, for the International Institute for Peace in Vienna and being the visiting professor and member of the strategic uh, committee at the Paris School of International Affairs. Until mid-2015, Angela served as the United Nations High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. It's a great honor to have you with us. Uh, please, everybody, put your hands together for Angela Kane, uh, the screen and uh, mic. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Martin. No need, no need for that at all. But uh, I want to uh, go back, actually, to my last job at the United Nations, as well as having uh, written a bit about um, uh, AI in the meantime, and particularly about the regulation of uh, military technology and where we are now. And when I look back at this, and thank you, Peter, you did a great introduction with the overview for the whole field, which serves me to delve into a much smaller, smaller part of it, and which is basically what has been happening at the UN. And particularly, I will come back to the term killer robots that you mentioned, and which clearly uh, I sense that you dislike, but I dislike as well. It's just more or less to appeal to emotions rather than really giving a view of what technology uh, is and can do, uh, because we all know how beneficial it is in many aspects as well. And um, what we're looking at really is you're looking at, you know, how can um, AI, the use of AI undermine international peace and security, particularly by being used in the, in the military, with military technology. And um, that is really important an issue to look at because that is something that uh, very often militaries are under government control and so therefore it's governments really that have the hand in it. It's not like uh, it's a private company that develops it. However, there is of course, as Peter also pointed out, a very strong economic incentive to say, <clears throat> yes, we are producing these weapons and we would like to sell them. And I can assure you with 20% of the arms expenditures having risen over the last 20 years, there's always a market and there's a very ready market for, for buying uh, these weapons. What I want to spend just a little bit of time on before we, we come to this is really the question of ethics, because um, we have really, you, you've mentioned this already in the terms of the face recognition that we've seen, but ethics really is a tremendous back point uh, to these, uh, to these uh, military technologies because uh, what comes into it is really international humanitarian law and how do we actually go about this in terms of when you talk about these lethal autonomous weapon systems as we call them uh, in, the, um, in the United Nations uh, circumlution. And I want to talk a little bit about how this all started because when I look at Peter having published a book already in 2009, the UN did not really come to this subject until 2013. And it's interesting to see how did, how did the UN get seized with this subject? And uh, there was a uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur under the Human Rights uh, Council, and he was a rapporteur on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary execution. And this again shows you that there is this ethical aspect that comes into it. And he wrote a report that was published in 2013. And what was it on? It was on the uh, use of lethal force through drones, exactly what you already mentioned and the prevalence of drones. That, uh, that is now really very uh, technology that's very widespread uh, in, in addition to military applications. And I found this very interesting and I remember he came to see me and he showcased the report and he basically sort of said something needs to be happening with this. We need to actually advance this and we need to advance the discussion on this topic so it goes outside a human rights concern but it actually goes into a much larger um, uh, area and it needs to be seized by governments, not from a human rights perspective, but from a peace and security perspective and also by a disarmament perspective, because what we need is we really need regulation in order to uh, regulate the drones, in order to regulate other military technology that is being used. And uh, then we were searching for a way of how could we bring it into the the dialogue and the difficulty with many of the regulations, particularly in disarmament and arms control, is it's always stovepiped. You know, you deal with nuclear, you deal with conventional, but this was an area that really fell outside of all of this. And so a mechanism was used as a convention that is located, meaning that the meetings take place in Geneva, and that's called the uh, Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. I don't want to go into the details, it's rather complicated because it's very convoluted, but on the other hand, there were meetings that were being held. And what we have now 
is we really have meetings. There was a uh, group of governmental uh, experts that was set up and they basically regularly uh, meet on these issues and they discuss these issues. Now that sounds very straightforward. And when you think from there to having a regulation in military technology is a, a very easy step, you are very wrong. First of all, what does it mean to have a group of governmental experts? It basically means exactly that you have people who are nominated by their governments to participate in such a group. And the difficulty that is in such a group is that they have to operate by consensus. And this consensus means that if you have a certain recommendation, if you have a report that would go forward, let's say to the General Assembly, if you don't agree as one of those members with the statements that are being made, you just have a veto right because you say, I do not agree with that statement and therefore uh, I cannot let this recommendation go forward. And as we have seen in the last really four or five years since these groups have been operating, the group of governmental experts was preceded by another body, but this group of experts has been operating for the last four years, there are governments that are not interested in seeing any progress at all. And this, to my mind, is a real issue because right now what you have is you have about 30 countries that have come out outright against having lethal autonomous weapon systems. And uh, there are others who are basically saying, well, let's look at this first, let's study it first, and let's see how we can actually make progress on this. And what is interesting is that when you look at the AI expert industry, if I can call it that, or the, the industry, you have actually very early on, I think it was in 2016 already, that you had AI experts who wrote a letter and they wrote a statement and uh, basically so said, we are against the development of these weapons. We would like this uh, to be discontinued simply because we think it can be used to such nefarious purposes and it's very lethal and it's against human rights and so forth. And they published this letter and when that did not really find a lot of resonance other than in very AI circles, then basically what happened is they wrote a letter to this, 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 this convention head and that didn't go anywhere. And I remember discussing it with them at the time. And I said, you know, this is not really good. You have to go and, and present it to the Secretary General. And that's what they did. But again, the Secretary General, I mean, he can be uh, making statements. And in fact, he has this, this Secretary General Guterres has come out in, in, against lethal autonomous weapons systems. But on the other hand, um, uh, he uh, really cannot steer the work of this group other than trying to have a, um, let's say, a moral influence on, on, on the debate. What is interesting when, when I look at this is that this lethal autonomous weapon systems, 61% of the public uh, is against because they say it crosses a, a moral line. And that is very strong, and I'm, I'm really very sorry that this doesn't reverberate much more often in the public. There was a study that was made, a global study that was made uh, by uh, about a year and a half ago, and that was the outcome that we found. So 61% really came out that they uh, don't have this. But basically, uh, what, uh, what we um, see is that the um, development of these uh, technology advances are already making a tremendous impact. And what Peter mentioned were particularly the drones. And I think that is one that when you look at where are drones being used, and I'm not talking about the drones that deliver packages or deliver food or put together uh, machines or, 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 or fast food or whatever. But on the other hand, uh, when you look at how drones are being used because they are already weaponized and they're used against, let's say, maybe non-state actors, uh, they might be used in Pakistan, they could be used in other areas. And I was very pleased to see at one point under the Obama administration that actually the US started a, uh, a drone policy, meaning that they had actually a policy that they stated and they said, this would be how you, you drones would be used. I thought that was positive because it was the only country that had it. It had, I found fault with it. I did not think that it was all that it should be. But on the other hand, it was a start, but of course it is long taken down. I do not, cannot find it anymore. I do not think it exists anymore under the Trump administration. And that really is, is very unfortunate. Now, when you look at regulation, you know, what does it really mean regulation in warfare? You have certain regulations that applies to every single weapon, uh, but you do not have that in, in AI or AI empowered uh, tech, uh, weapons. And uh, the, um, it must be used, and that is the common view, that it, it must be used in accordance with international humanitarian law. And what you have is you have an Article 36, 
of the additional protocol one of the uh, Geneva Conventions. And um, what uh, you have to really, it's, it is basically saying that if there is a new weapon, a means or a method of warfare, there is an obligation to determine whether its employment would be prohibited by the protocol or by any other rule of international law uh, applicable uh, to, to the high contracting party, meaning the, the country that is party to the Geneva Convention. And what we have seen, of course, since World War I, even since World War II, is a tremendous expansion of the body of international law. So it's much strengthened, but that does not mean that every country that right now is developing AI-empowered weaponry is really willing to abide by those conventions or willing to abide by that or accept that the, um, that the uh, international humanitarian law applies to this. And what, what you have is really, we're looking at, and uh, that was already mentioned, is what you're looking at is really, you look at accountability. Uh, what is the accountability of violations of this international humanitarian law? I mean, is the machine going to be held responsible? Is it going to be the operator? Is it going to be the manufacturer? Uh, or, you know, who, the person who starts uh, not loose, uh, letting it loose, so to say? I mean, so who's going to be responsible? And I think that uh, the one example that showed in one of the pictures of Peter, for example, the Tesla, when the um, automatically driven car killed a person, there was a big discussion about what does that really mean legally so one one of the uh, one of the aspects that we need to look at is where does the accountability lie and uh, so where do we actually handle this in terms of the future development it's very very difficult to determine individual responsibility and uh, so uh, the uh, there are a number of states that have actually agreed that if no person could be found responsible for the actions of the weapon system and that would not be acceptable because at least a person must be held accountable. And that's usually called the women in the, uh, the person in the loop or the person on the loop. So there has to be a human interaction. So it's not going to be a totally independent autonomous weapon uh, that could be, could be loosened. Now, <clears throat> there are some progress, there is some progress in this group of experts that I've uh, mentioned. Um, they had their first meeting in November 2017, so just about three years ago. But on the other hand, if you think about it, they're holding about two meetings a year of five days each. Uh, very cumbersome, very slow, plus also the uh, experts, they sometimes change, there are new people coming on board. So there's usually a, a bit of repetition, if I can call it that, going over the same ground. And there was the first two, three years were really looking at what are the various scenarios, what are the questions that we need to look at, we need to find out we're all on the common ground. That took a long time. Have we actually made progress or has there actually been a regulation already developed in that group? No, there hasn't. There are so-called guiding principles and those guiding principles are that international humanitarian law uh, applies uh, to these lethal autonomous weapon systems. A human must always be responsible for the decision to use these systems and states must examine the legality of these new weapons that they're developing or that they're acquiring at a later stage. And also that the new policy measures, and this is a very important one, should not hamper progress in or access to peaceful uses of intelligent autonomous technologies. And that's sometimes a little bit murky in terms of what does that mean? You know, where do we go with this? But this is the most significant achievement that has come out of this group. And as I said, after four years, but on the other hand, they are not really an adequate or an appropriate response to the multiple concerns that are raised by, uh, by the, you know, these autonomous weapons, because they were simply intended to guide the discussions. That yes, they were, they were accepted as guidance for the discussion, but not as principles that would actually be already applicable. And that to my mind is really very important because there needs to be a lot more uh, progress needs to be made. Uh, when you also, um, that is basically where we are. The next meeting of this group uh, is going to be later this year, again, one week. Uh, and there are some countries, as I mentioned, 30 of them that have said, we should never have these weapons. We should never, uh, we should forbid them altogether. And one, one aspect of why it is in this convention on certain conventional weapons is because there are certain protocols. And uh, there is a protocol that was adopted 
by member states and this was a they banned a weapon before it actually came on the market and that was the blinding laser weapons and that is seen as a possible precursor for the lethal autonomous weapon systems but frankly i think that rubicon has been crossed i think it's too late for that already we're too far in terms of the uh, development of it already and also for the use of it so i don't think that that is really something that is still applicable and there is increasing pessimism that we will actually come to a, a regulation. And when it comes to the promise of AI, which uh, Peter has, has mentioned very strongly, uh, I, I agree with, with, with him that there is tremendous promise. And I want to just go back, for example, China in 2017 issued a blueprint and they had a blueprint that was forecasting 25 years of what do we do with AI. And of course, that's a government steered activity in many cases also steered in terms of private industry, and they wanted to be the leader in AI uh, by 25 years from 2017. And Putin came out shortly afterwards, and I think his remark got a lot more traction because he basically said, whoever will master AI will be the master of the world. And that is something that we are now living with. But I want to stress that when it comes to military warfare, we have to be very careful as to where it goes. And the um, <clears throat> campaign against killer robots uh, is one that is very powerful. It's capturing the imagination, particularly of younger people. There's a lot of activism there. And I think that has drawn tremendous um, uh, focus onto this question, which I think is good. But on the other hand, I think we should not underestimate the fact that despite the opposition by the Secretary General, by the Pope, for example, and by AI experts, which I find, and find interesting, is hasn't really had enough of an impact to actually come into regulation in terms of having a legal aspect. There is a possibility, what can you do and not leave it up to the 25 experts meeting on the subject, is you could basically bring this issue into the General Assembly, you could draft a treaty, but on the other hand, you might draft a treaty that doesn't find any acceptance and particularly not find acceptance among the countries that are very deep into developing artificial uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, and that is one of the extent. Two words on cyber. And again, cyber has been on the uh, agenda of the uh, United Nations since 1998, believe it or not. Uh, it was called information technology at the time. It still is called information technology, but basically very, very slow progress, very few agreements as to where it goes. And uh, when you read the reports that are coming out, they are not very inspiring in terms of making you think that actually you're gonna have a cyber regulation. Again, I think the genie is out of the bottle and it's going to be very hard to push it back again and let it be ruled by uh, certain uh, regulations that would be applicable uh, to all member states. Let me end here and wait for the questions. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you also, Peter. Uh, I see there are some, some good questions in the chat already. Please keep them coming. Uh, and I'll take the privilege to ask uh, a first question. And, you know, listening to you guys, I get this very, pessimistic feeling um, and I'm, I'm, I'm super curious if there's like, do you see any like, I mean, there are some positive um, regulatory aspects of this that we see, that we see coming, um, but from, from sort of a, you know, global security perspective and also with, with, with sort of like, you know, peace and stability as a North star, um, where, where do you see, where do you see this development going? What's what's what sort of the, will it end up in sort of a, a a nuclear blast before it gets better, so to speak, uh, or are they? How, so basically, how, how do you how do you see warfare develop with AI, and also to sort of maybe this is for you, Peter. Do we need another name for this? Is like is is war even like a bad name for the capabilities of what this technology is able to? I was named, so I'll I'll jump on that first. Um, so the I think part of this is um, the challenge in talking about technology is there is a long history of techno optimism, whatever the new technology is, invariably both um, the inventors of it, but then the political community around it says, aha, 
this is the technology that will finally lead to world peace. Um, it happened with uh, the telegraph, uh, the, the inventor of it, uh, his brother congratulated him on finally having the invention that would do that uh, to, um, and you know, within weeks it was being uh, used for military movement orders. Uh, it happened even with things that were obviously uh, destructive, um, the story of Nobel and dynamite. Uh, it happened uh, with um, social media. Uh, remember all the the discourse over you know how Facebook was finally going to uh, liberate the world and and uh, etc. There's a long history of techno optimism, and I think you know that's what you're hearing is a slight pushback against that, which is that look, um, technologies have both good and bad effects, and they can be used by both good and bad people. That is the story throughout history from the very first stone that was picked up. Our very first human tool was used either to uh, maybe build a fire or to bash someone in the head. And it's the same thing from stones to drones today, good and bad applications of it. And we need to be honest and forthright and see that. Um, there's many areas of AI that I'm incredibly optimistic about. Uh, I think AI offers um, maybe one of the key ways out of global climate change when you think about um, energy efficiency and what smart cities might allow. Um, AI has uh, been part of some of the key responses to the coronavirus pandemic, including um, maybe helping find treatments for it. So there's positives, but you asked us to speak to what does it mean for war and peace? And it's, I think it is, it's a disruptive technology. Um, and that means it creates these new kinds of questions. And then importantly, the transition period is gonna be very fraught. Uh, when you have new technologies and you don't well understand them and you're figuring out how they work, that again, historically is a challenging period. Uh, that's part of the story of the, the lead up to World War I where the powers thought they understood what railroads and machine guns meant for war. And so here again, people say, oh, well, there's never gonna be a war again. And yet we saw application of it. I think that's the case with AI. Um, to your final question about, you know, um, uh, does it mean we need to redefine war? Um, no, I don't think so, because um, we're still talking about the application of it to a human endeavor. We're not in Star Trek world where the AIs are fighting each other and, and we're not part of it. Um, that's an old Star Trek uh, TV series episode. Um, uh, but it's more about applying it to all these different military tasks, not just the killer robot front end, but even who gets selected for the military. How do they get trained? These are all applications that are right now being thought out. Um, but war is still about us. It's still about our politics, our failings, our arrogance. Um, I think what you're hearing from Angela and I, though, is that we're concerned about failures of understanding about this technology and also um, trying to establish what are the rules of the game and the rules of the game, both in terms of kind of the con concepts of how you use it, but also the written down rules of what are the laws that you need. And um, that, that's, a, that's a core question for us moving forward. And we're not gonna solve it by um, misunderstanding the technology or saying, well, this is just sci-fi stuff. Let me, let me just add here a little bit, and I think there's uh, one aspect, and I, it's absolutely true that, you know, wars are still being fought. There hasn't been a declaration of war since the Second World War, we forget that, but there are just hundreds of conflicts that are going on, and actually very serious ones, but without a declaration of war. But I remember, uh, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember, all of the body bags coming back from Vietnam War. You know, just think about it, First World War, people were actually fighting other people. Second World War, in many aspects, yes, yes, but helped by planes, et cetera, et cetera. But it was still a people-to-people -people combat in, in most aspects. You don't have that anymore. You could have now someone sitting, launching whatever, drones, missiles, whatever, 3,000 kilometers away against a, a country uh, where, you know, the war is being fought or the terrorists are being fought or whatever. But what happens is that you have a tremendous amount of civilian uh, damage, meaning a val val a civilians are usually the ones, it's not going to be the fighters because you don't have a fighting army anymore. They're not consolidated. They're not uh, in one space, but you have a lot of civilians who actually are harmed by these uh, technologies uh, if they're being indiscriminately uh, uh, targeted. And maybe even, 
targeted in a, in a specialized way, but there are always going to be civilians around. And that is something where one has to think twice about how do you actually do this? And that's why the human on the loop or the human in the loop is really important. But even then, I mean, is this the way? Because this goes against countries and people who usually don't have the means to fight back. And that is something that is also very important. I mean, if you have, where, where are drones being used? Um, you know, the drones are being used, as I mentioned, in Pakistan, maybe they're used in Sudan. And I remember there was, uh, just about two years ago, there was a tremendous discussion in the Security Council with the peacekeeping operation because the peacekeeping forces wanted to use drones to basically have um, supervision of what was happening, you know, just 10 kilometers or even 100 kilometers away because they didn't have that predictability in terms of what was happening there. And uh, it was finally allowed, but with a great um, concern also by the country in which the peacekeeping operation was deployed because they have to give consent to that. Because there is fear, there's insecurity, and there's also a fear that is being used in a way that actually is very harmful for civilians in particular, but also for the countries who don't have a way to uh, basically use the same instruments or use the same technology to, to retaliate. And so you need to have you need to have ground rules, you need to have rules. You have them for most everything else, but on the other hand, you don't have them for technology-empowered, AI-empowered weapons yet. And that's what we need. Yep, and uh, I think we all support you in your, in your work in, in making that happen. Uh, and but now I want to hand, hand over to, to Jeanette for some uh, questions from, from the audience. Mm -hmm. There has been a question from Michaela Zabata. Maybe I can hand over to you. Just unmute your mic. Hello. Hello to everyone. Uh, so uh, my question was for both speakers. Thank you to both for your presentation. And uh, my question was about what do you think that are going to be the the impacts of uh, AI on military strategy of developed military powers to uh, non-regular conflicts in the developing world? And uh, when I was making this question, I was thinking about the things like long distance war uh, with uh, drones uh, in places like Afghanistan that we see uh, a more uh, and a more often use of this kind of technology and we don't see uh, very effective military results and also like Angela mentioned it, we see a lot of uh, human rights issues with this kind of technology? Martin, would you like me to answer, answer that? Or? Yeah. So I, I would um, say uh, it's a great question and um, there's four quick points I would make in response to it. The first is, um, so the scenario that you're asking about is what happens when um, more powerful states intervene into uh, weak state zones, so you know, along the lines of an Afghanistan or the like, um, and how might they use AI? We're already getting tastes of this. Um, one is, uh, for example, a project called Gorgon Stair that was um, first developed by the US for Iraq and elsewhere. Um, it's the idea that you would not just be using um, uh, drones, um, but you could use, combine it with artificial intelligence and multiple sensors so that you could monitor an entire city to try and not just uh, find an uh, insurgent activity, but then backtrack from it. So that you, for example, when uh, a rebel, you know, in the, in the pre prior to this, they might um, launch an attack, a roadside bomb, and then that would you would not know who did it and they might filter back into the crowd. The idea here is that by filming everything from on high, but also street cameras on the like, that you could then um, 
walk it backwards as an example and see the entire trail of life of that. So here's the bomb. Here's where they came from. Here's the hideout that they utilized. Um, and that you could also then, here's all the people that came to that hideout uh, over the last two weeks. Where did they come from? And that you could map the, uh, the insurgency in a way that previously was not possible. Um, the second, as I mentioned, is to be able to potentially have more precise action and therefore um, that large states might need less forces on the ground. So that example of a uh, face recognition technology, you know, here again in, in these, um, as you described, non-regular conflicts, um, it, the real challenge is finding the foe. So you would um, be able to pull a, a, a face out of a crowd if you've got a suspected terrorist. Um, that, though, I think the big change of this is not in the conflict itself, but how certain powers are maybe using this to keep these conflicts from even starting. Uh, that is how China is applying it in some of its most restive regions, where it's doing massive scale, well past what a George Orwell ever imagined, of monitoring of the entire population, force checks on them, face recognition, and so the result is that it's this new kind of police state that um, they see it for public security reasons you know, to control it and to keep an insurgency from even beginning. I look at it and I'm deeply disturbed by the massive rights violations that are playing out. The final fourth point though, is that this technology in no way, shape or form is it limited just to the big powerful states. Small states can access it. Over 30 different nations, for example, have met with China about how can maybe they utilize this to control their own populations. That scares me. Um, but also uh, rebel groups, terrorist groups, they can use this to fight back. So we're seeing an example of this in um, Yemen, for example, right now. Uh, the conflict there, the rebel group has used drones to strike back into Saudi Arabia. Just this week, they carried out an attack in Riyadh. In, in the old days, a rebel group on the ground could not hit hundreds of miles away back at the intervening nation. Now they've got that capability. So it's a very different kind of here again, change in war. I think, I think that's very true. And um, I think particularly the face recognition is extremely dangerous in that sense, uh, I would say, because it basically builds up a record uh, a database that you can always tap in later if you're looking at certain groups. And it is also true that uh, countries, other countries that don't develop those weapons may have the wherewithal to buy them, however. And that is something that, is, again, is very dangerous. And not only countries, but also, as you said, insurgent groups uh, could do that. And we have seen attacks that were launched, for example, on the Saudi oil fields, what was it, last year? and uh, or the oil uh, refineries, et cetera. So it's sometimes very hard also to sort of say who is the originator because it doesn't always have a national fingerprint on it. And uh, so it's something that we really need to look at in terms of how do you want to regulate this? With regard to the face recognition, I found it very interesting that for example, the Google employees uh, two years ago uh, revolted and said that Google should not further develop this face recognition software. And uh, they then stepped back from it. It was a relatively small amount for them financially to step back from. But on the other hand, if they don't do it, then someone else will pick up the technology and someone else will develop it and someone else will sell it because there's a lot of money behind this. There's a market for it. And again, this brings me back to the idea that you really, is, is the genie out of the bottle? Can we put it back again or is there a way to say that we need to look at this. I find, for example, that the, <clears throat> the European Union has made a lot of effort to have ethical guidelines for the use of AI, whether it's in weapons or in other areas. And that to me is, is very important. I wish that it was replicated in other countries or in other regional groupings, but unfortunately it isn't that true yet. There are a lot of ethical boards, and that is ethical boards in companies, in companies that are either developing or producing uh, military software, AI-empowered software. But I sometimes find that when you look at what these ethical boards are doing and what their mandates are, 
that it isn't always as effective as it should be because uh, it's a little bit window dressing. And I'm sorry I'm being very harsh here, but on the other hand, I don't find it as effective as it should be in terms of a saying, if there are ethical um, cons concerns, then we really should be stepping back from having AI empowered weapons or AI empowered manufacture of weapons. And that does not happen. But it should be looked at in a more cohesive manner. What are the ethical circumstances? What are companies using and what are countries doing in terms of the ethical concerns that we all have about these weapons? Thank you. Uh, I hope we have time for one last question. There are two questions from Benito Geronimo. I hope I pronounced it right. So the mic is yours. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to, to be here. These, these speakers are amazing. Uh, my, my question, my question is, is it's about principles or protocols um, or methodologies about ab about ethics, so mainly uh, about how can prevent about uh, ethics and artificial intelligence uh, or the, bueno, to detect or prevent arms in against against race war or or protect human, human being. I'm, I'm not sure I've quite understood that question. Yes, it's, it's, it's about, about principles or methodologies in order to prevent, uh, or how can to, to use artificial intelligence or in order to, to detect or prevent uh, or to protect, it, it, it really is to protect the human. And how to protect humans. I think that the, um, that's, that's a, it's, it's an important question because the question is always about, you know, civilians do get hurt, uh, combatants do get hurt. So how can you protect those who need yeah. to be protected? That's, that's, that's very true. And I think the only way that I would address this is to really look at the Geneva Conventions, to look at international humanitarian law. The uh, International Committee on the Red Cross has done quite a bit of work on that because they have, um, uh, they, they have seized on this in a major way to sort of say they need to be a lot more active and they have become a lot more active in the last couple of years because they, they want to look at it in terms of saying, how can we actually prevent these weapons to become more prevalent? And what can we actually do to further the norm, the norm that exists in the Geneva Conventions to protect civilians in particular, and to also uh, not to have attacks that are indiscriminately launched against an area or against a population where it is difficult to distinguish between civilians and between combatants or terrorists or whatever the case may be. And that is, is something that I think people are looking at more and more now. And that is why I said that when you look at this poll that was taken about a year and a half ago, that 61% of the population globally that was polled, and there were thousands of people who were polled, uh, are against uh, this technology, and particularly in AI empowered military weapons. Uh, that is a very high percentage. And I just wish that that would be a little bit more known or a little bit more discussed because it isn't. I mean, we always hear about killer robots, but I find that a little bit too sens sensationalist, if I can call that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that I particularly dislike. I know that lethal autonomous weapon system is not a very thing that rolls off your tongue, but on the other hand, it's a, it obscures the fact that there are a lot of, as Peter has outlined already, a lot of good applications of technology that are very good in terms of helping humans. So it's not only the bad aspects, but there are also very positive aspects about AI. I would just real rapidly add um, two things. The one is that we might also look um, even further back in history for guidance on what will be possible or not. So at the turn of the last century, there were new technologies, um, naval mines at sea, that uh, they scared everyone. But on the other hand, I think there's a parallel here. Um, the militaries looked at them and said, you know what? 
I don't like the other guy having them, but I like, I like having them for me. And that you were not going to get to, and I think this is going to be the case with AI, maybe I'm being negative here, I don't think you're going to get to the case of an outright ban because they're just too darn useful. So around, um, if I remember my years correctly, 1907, um, there was an agreement, though, that said, okay, we're going to use them, though. Are there ways that we can collectively agree we don't want them used because they will harm wider society? So they created limits, for example, where they said where you could use them and certain ways and how you could use them. So mines at sea, they said, you can have them um, in your harbor, protecting your harbor, but you can't just have them floating out in the ocean whereupon it could just bash into anything over the entire world. Um, and I think there's some parallels here with, for example, autonomous systems where we might say, you know what, we're never gonna ban them all, but there might be certain sectors that we're more comfortable seeing them used, for example, in undersea warfare, where the civilian casualty concern is less likely. There's no civilian submarines that it might mistake uh, for a military submarine and kill versus, hey, an urban setting, that's a lot easier to uh, have a mistake between a school bus and a tank. So we might create certain spaces. We all also might create certain ways of creating um, responsibility. Uh, a check it's, you can use them, but someone has to take ownership of them it's to sign off on the use of them. So when it goes wrong, Captain so-and-so is the one who's responsible. And that's an indirect way of getting to more responsibility. Oh, by the way, I think the same things need to happen with robotics on our streets. In the United States, uh, we literally this week had um, a decision made that there was an Uber car, an aut autonomous car that um, accidentally killed someone and the human driver was the one legally held responsible, not the company that deployed the car, which I think is not a great outcome. Um, the uh, second real rapid thing I would say is that whether it's the Geneva Conventions or you think of the science fiction of um, Asimov's Three Laws, every law, every sense of ethics, it's open to interpretation we're not gonna be able to program our way out of this. So Geneva Conventions, you know, Martin mentioned um, serving in Kosovo. I also did work back in the day there. There's G Geneva Conventions, and yet we saw challenges of trying to figure out how to apply them in that war zone. So for example, one, um, the, one conflict actor had a tank, but they put kids on top of the tank. Could you shoot at the tank or not? That's a real world example that humans wrestled with I don't expect a machine to find it somehow easier. And so we should expect that um, even when we get these laws, we're still going to have human debates over right and wrong. The, the machine's not going to solve them for us just by programming it. Please follow Geneva Convention's machine. They're always open to interpretation and debate. And um, that, that, I think, is another illustration of kind of the, the alteration is um, we'll still be having the old debates, but flowing in new ways. So unfortunately, I think we have to come to an end here. It was very good to talking with you. And I want to thank um, Martin, Angela, and Peter for uh, the last pleasant hour, maybe not so pleasant uh, regarding the topics, but uh, yeah, it gives us a lot to think about. But before we uh, finally end, I want to share my screen and... Uh, draw your attention to our upcoming uh, couch lessons about AI and language, AI and music, and AI and intimacy. And next week, we will speak with um, a journalist, with a um, computer linguist, and with a writer about the ability of AI to translate and to write texts. And I hope you will see each other again next Wednesday. And uh, yeah, hope you have had a good hour with us and see you soon.